21 when you joined the service, but you didn't do it by choice, did you? I was drafted when I was 22. 22? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was drafted. Uh, and they, back then they used a, it was in 1952, and they used a lottery system to, to get the quota of, of uh, train, to train people, become soldiers. And, uh, but I was 22. And I got out when I was uh, uh, two years later in 1990, 1954. And I was in the 5th Infantry Division and the 101 Screaming Eagles. And what we did, of course, was peacekeeping over there and in Germany. And we would back up. We, I was stationed in Augsburg. And what they did was uh, we'd pack up our two and a half ton uh, trucks and go to different sites and set up camps. And my job was to, uh, because I had uh, was a, an apprentice for an electrician in one of the local steel mills, they picked me to uh, provide the electricity and lighting in the officer's tents, the big tents. And uh, I, it was not just me, there was probably six of us that would uh, climb the trees and string the lines from the generator that we towed to the officer, officer's tents, tent, a big tent, and they did their, all their gameplay in that time. And we did that all over Germany. We then would go back to Augsburg and spend uh, maybe a month, month and a half, and then we'd go to another location and do the, do the same thing so and uh, to me uh, the fact that it was in Germany in such a pretty country and especially the southern part Bavarian part and Augsburg is close to Bavaria and uh, it was a good tour of duty it really was for me so it was good well, I'll definitely come back to a bunch of things that you just mentioned um, I'll try to stick a little uh, chronological just for a little bit but um the you were drafted um yeah. but obviously at 22 maybe you weren't considering the military at all you know did you already have your sights set on other things at that point in time at that point in time i had just started as an apprentice electrician at the local steel mill it was uh a, a good job because uh, I was learning a trade and I had not considered uh, the military. No, had I not been drafted, I would never have joined. But did you, well, I guess too, then once you were drafted, did you find the, the patriotism inside you a little bit? Or, I mean, did you find that you were serving a call or did you feel like you just kind of had your, your feet taken out from under you? Uh, the second. Okay. It, no, I yeah. mean, expect it's expected. Um, yeah, and, you know, exactly. Um, but at least it managed to be something that, that benefited your life overall, I guess. It's impression right. your daughter gave you quite a bit. Um, yes. Now, did you have any military in your family at that time? Had anybody, you know? No, not really. Uh, I did have an uncle. He was in the Merchant Marine in the Second World War. All right. And... Uh, he was on three different uh, vessels that were sunk, and he's managed to survive. And he would tell tell us the little ones the stories. And uh, but other than that, there was no other military contact within the family. Interesting. Um, so I mean, it had to have been a little bit of a culture shock too at boot camp. Um, anything? Yeah, it wasn't bad. Well, I, I sort of enjoyed the training because I've, uh, when I was five or six, I got my first BB gun and shooting I, came natural to me. It really did. I, the poor birds in my area, they, <laughs> I, they took a beating. And anyway, um, uh, from there, of course, being in the army, uh, I went to New Jersey for my uh for my boot camp, for my training, New Jersey, 
uh, don't remember the name of the, the uh, camp, but anyway, it went there and it, it was great to, uh, to learn how to shoot the big guns, I guess. <laughs> I had one friend that went through boot camp and he exclaimed that his, his biggest fun was when he was on the range and he had a range officer that was nice enough to tell him that he probably wouldn't get to touch half the guns that he had seen there during boot camp. And if he wanted to shoot them, now is the time. And he yep. said he stayed and he shot every last thing and threw every grenade he could throw <laughs> just to see what they all did. Yeah. <laughs> Even learned how to throw a grenade. <laughs> well, now it is curious because, I mean, you, you went to Germany um, but I mean, obviously, the reason that there was a draft was because there was a war going on. That's and, right. I mean, you know, I know that, you know, the Marines and the Army alike were, were asking for as many people as possible. My grandfather was drafted by the Army. And when he was waiting, a Marine came in and said, we need five guys. And he went with the Marines. So, I mean, he was, you know, drafted by the Marines. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's so... You know, luckily, I guess you didn't take that offer because you got a little better gig going right. to Germany. Now, um, did was there an air about that at boot camp? Was it one of those things where, I mean, it wasn't like you were training for peacetime? We were, I mean, we were training for war, big war. Yeah. And I'm just curious if that played out on, on you or, or people that you were with or people that you went through boot camp with didn't get the Germany ticket. Like, you know. Um, do you know well, anything? Half, half, of, half of my company in the boot camp, of course, went to, they went to Korea and the other half went to Germany. So I lost contact with my friends that went to Korea. But, uh, and in that, in my camp, there were, it was a combination of draftees and enlistees. It was a, it was a mixture. And I, I think, the people, the men, the guys that enlisted have a different uh, outlook <laughs> on why they're there. Uh, they just, they chose to be there. And I'm not so sure if they were t just taking a chance on not going to Korea, but I don't think anybody wanted to go to Korea. No. I I, I, by, by 1952, it was well known that it was not a nice place and it was not a nice environment. Exactly. And it, and it was necessarily, you know, not really a, an outcome either, you know. Right. Um, so, you know, that answers, you, you know, how you, you avoided combat in Korea. You got the luck of the draw, but it was because you had some electrical history already under right. your belt. Um, now, but at 22, did you find yourself to be a little older than the average guy there, or? Uh, it was sort of a mixture. There were a few older than me, but the majority, probably within a plus or minus uh, a year or two of, of my age, it was a little bit of a mixture, not much, though. Well, as far as the combat veterans and stuff go, I mean, 22 is, is an old guy, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, now you were in for two years, you were in right. Germany and, um, like you said, you were, you were providing power to officers. Was that a commodity that the enlisted didn't get? No, I never thought <laughs> I'd be doing that. Well, uh, along the lines that we're talking, uh, when I first uh, went in, it was with a company of about 179 and we went through two days of testing, uh, IQ kind of testing, uh, and uh, answering questions on a piece of paper. And anyway, they picked five or six of us, I guess the top ones, and I was in that top, uh, and they offered me uh, a chance to go to OCS school, Officers Candidate School. And all I had to do was, uh, um, agreed for staying in two more years. In other words, a total of four years. If I, uh, I would go to the school and hopefully come out as a second lieutenant. And, but the only, I, and I turned it down. And the only reason I turned it down is because I found out 
before I even went in that an officer is available throughout his whole life to be recalled. Gotcha. But you go out in the civilian world, you fight in the Korea, go out and, so, and then the Vietnam War comes along. You, you, you have no say so. You are required because you're in the reserve. You can't get out of it. You're required to go back and fight some more. And that, that I knew ahead of time. And that's why I turned it down, the OCS. It's almost signing a second commitment on top of the first one. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know, too, but in 1952, they were pretty short on officers in Korea. And That's rather, right. you know, rather than them make the boat trip, they were flying them in. Um, so, I mean, that that could have been your short ticket to Korea, too. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yes, it would have been. Um, so that's, you know, it sounds like you've made some some good choices as far as what was going on for, for luck. Um, now, I'm curious, you know, you're you're within a, a decade of the end of World War II in Germany right. so when you're there. Exactly. And so I'm really curious, you know, it obviously has had plenty of time to rebuild and, and re grow and you know, completely erase maybe some of the, the history that was there as far as World War II go. Um, but I mean, were you witness to, to some of damage? I mean, was, was there yes. infrastructure and things that you could still point back to yes. World War II? As we traveled through, through uh, close to some of the major cities, I could still see buildings that were torn apart by bombing, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yes. But they were rebuilding uh, Germany quite fast. Uh, uh, who was providing the uh, funds? I know whether it's all the countries or just the United States, but they were n nothing like the war pictures, the actual end of the war pictures. But they I, were, yeah, I imagine they had some time to recover and some trees got some, you know, leaves and, and the grass was back. But, you know, I, just the infrastructure alone. You know, there's a couple hundred years of cities there that just got flattened. Um, right. I, I can't imagine the pile of rocks, you know. Um, right. But I'm just curious, you know, traveling around Germany, you were witnessing that and, and you know, putting two and two together, I imagine. Um, yeah. Now, as far as your electrical goes, I mean, was the army providing any support with Germany's infrastructure, or were you basically just concerned with your operations and your company? Basically, I was concerned with, uh, involved with only my company and my operation and their operations, yes. I did not get involved with anything to do with or rebuilding or restructuring Germany, no, no. So um, what were your, your tools of the trade traveling around? I mean, imagine you got a pair of linesman pliers that are pretty important to you. Exactly. Uh, climbing spikes that you strapped onto your legs to go up the trees, oh, typically 20 feet off the ground. And you go from, I would go from tree to tree to loop the electrical lines from the generator into the uh, headquarters uh, tents. Yes. Generally, how far of a run were you making with something like that? How far away were the generators? To, uh, to... Far enough so that the noise didn't interfere with what they did. So gotcha. sometimes it was pretty far because the joiner, they, back then the generators were quite loud. <laughs> These are big, big diesel. Were they three phase or were they two phase? Uh, they were gasoline. Okay. Uh, yeah, gasoline and... Uh, Fairly big, fairly big generators. And we would keep those running too, of course. That was part of our, our duty. Keep them gassed, uh, be sure the, the maintenance was done, the filters changed and stuff like that. Was it, was it generating two-phase power or was it? Uh, it was generating two-phase power. It okay. was not three, but two, so, yeah. So you had some tinkering on the generators to keep that all working and stuff like that, right? Yeah, right. Um, I've installed my share of generators. It's I did oh, a res okay. yeah, my father owns an electrical company, and I did my my share of residential applications yeah. too. Yeah. So I'm really, you know, I was curious about what you were dealing with there as far as 
Um, it doesn't sound like you were ever on shore power of any sort. Were you always providing your own power? Uh, we always did. Every time okay. we went, never tapped into any of the local power. It was always remote. It was never close to a town or city. It'd be always in the remote paths of the wood of the forest somewhere. And uh, they were where we would set up. Yeah. Were you were you aware of what um, I guess your company was up to? I mean, they do a pretty good job in the military keeping everybody's business to themselves, but. You know, what was everybody doing out there? <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, they, it was kept a secret more or less. Uh, in other words, from a, a secret between the officers or what they were doing and the enlisted uh, men, the men, the uh, infantry uh, that, uh, supporting them. Uh, no, that, that was a secret. But it became obvious after a while what they were doing, just in basic terms, mm -hmm. trying to, uh, what they were doing is practicing. If say we would uh, have been invaded, say Germany would have been invaded again by Russia. And that's what uh, Eisenhower was afraid of back then. And that's why we were there. But should they uh, actually start an attack, uh, we would have been just the slow, uh, the uh, infantry division that slows them down until, <laughs> until the uh, heavy gotcha. infantry. Come in there. That that was basically what it boiled down to. That's a pretty sobering thought, though, in itself. Oh yeah, because we're the uh, we're sort of like the su Suicide Squad, perhaps. We, we wouldn't last long. <laughs> well, the, I imagine you'd give them hell while you were there. You know, um, I'm not sure what they expected you all to do if if Russia decided to to come on and through. Um, now, was that something? that, you know, besides being on your mind, um, was there any moments where, you know, somebody thought something was going on? Was there ever any, you know, uh, what's that guy doing? Why, you know, is that a Russian, that type of stuff? Never, never ran into anything like that. No. Uh -uh. And I, of course, we, uh, deer foxholes and, uh, so, and some of the, uh, when it, in, when it got cold and we went out, we would uh, set up tents for the for ourselves. And uh, but uh, how often would you rotate back to the base in what Augsburg? Is that what you said? Yeah, Augsburg was the base. Uh, it's where the barracks were. I would say on an average we were doing three to four. They called them bivouacs uh, a year. So I was there right. two years. So I would probably average seven to eight, going out, uh, setting up camp, uh, stringing the electrical wires, starting up the generators and keeping them running. And we'd be there for typically at least a week, sometimes two weeks, yeah. Uh, so same same deal back at base though, you'd still be running power. At the base we did nothing special, you know, nothing special back at the base. Um. Did you have anything particularly challenging to you when you were ever there? Did you ever run up against something or even a, a stubborn generator? You know, nothing, no, nothing major challenging, not really. Just thinking back, not nothing really challenging, no. Uh -uh. And of um, course, the end result was that I was very fortunate, not very fortunate, I guess, but. Uh, the fact that the military paid for four years at uh, Pitt was, and got me an engineering degree, that, that was the, the, the great spinoff. <laughs> so you, you're, you've done your two years in Germany and you're headed home. What is, what is that like? I mean, any fanfare? Uh, you know, uh, did you have anybody waiting it was, for you? It, it, well, I, I, parts I could remember quite well. Others are not so well. Uh, but it was uh, enlightening or really uh, uh, got to you was pulling in on the ship, pulling into uh, seeing the Statue of Liberty. That was uh, eye opening, I have to say. And, uh, 
and then getting back to my mom, my mother and dad, and my brothers and my sisters was great. It really did. Overall, it really felt good. I have to say it's the way I could describe it. Getting back to the United States on firm land and having met my commitment. And, uh, and, it, and I had already, just be, before I left uh, Germany, I had made up my mind I wanted to go to school. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, they, they released me one month early, shy of two, of two years, so I could make the fall semester. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, that, which was just great. I mean, in other words, I, I didn't lose a whole half year in, in getting educated. I had four years continuous and, it, and that was great too, of course. I, I can't think, imagine how iconic, I guess it was to come home and see the Statue of Liberty. Now I've heard a handful of guys um, coming home from Korea and you know, the Golden Gate would have been their, their big, oh, we're home. There's no mistake in it now. Um, yeah, yeah even, even more iconic, I would guess, would be the Statue of Liberty. That's that's pretty pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and so you're 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 off to school, um, and you've uh, you've had all this experience, I guess. Now, how did anything play out from the army, whether learned or otherwise, that 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 helped you, I guess, get through school and get to uh, becoming what your your final goal and profession was. I'm not sure what what you said there. I'm curious if um, mm -hmm. what you might have learned in the army, behavior, uh, even skills, or otherwise that that helped you then get through college, and um, then eventually become a nuclear engineer. You know. Yeah, I would have to say that. Uh, even though I was with my uh, fellow uh, man uh, in, in the infantry and, you, and you, you develop, when you're in two years in one spot, you develop a lot of friends. Uh, it gave, I guess I would have to say that the experience instilled more confidence in being able to do anything I want. And that's maybe it helped me get, go into college for four years. It was not easy getting a degree. It was, it was a lot of hard work. And uh, of course, that's what I've done in my whole uh, working career engineer, is electrical engineering. Um, whereabouts in Pennsylvania are you? I am uh, in Beth uh, Baldwin Borough. Okay. I have now, I have a uh, family from Wilkes Bar. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, they would have been the same generation of immigrants, I guess, as your parents. Um, but they came from Poland. And, uh, you know, uh, my, my great grandfather, Red, died of black lung because the coal miner was the only profession. And right. um, my grandmother um, actually joined the Marines to avoid all that stuff. So my grandmother was a Marine, too. But... Um, you know, I'm curious, was there, when you returned home and now you've got this gift of, of going to college and stuff like that, I mean, was that just a, a ticket out of town? I mean, was it freedom that was, wouldn't have been available before? Because, I mean, I see a lot it, it of... Would, yeah, uh, it would not, it was not available before I went into the army, not for me, because uh, uh, mainly... Back then, I never heard or realized you might be able to borrow money to uh, pay for college. Uh, I, my parents could never have afforded to even help me go to. And like, like you said about the black lung, I had a grandfather that died of black lung working in the coal mines. But uh, chances are, I would never have gone to uh, never been able been able to go to college to get a degree had I not gone into the military, had I not been drafted, yes. It seems like a pretty national thing in the 50s. There were lots of people that just, there was nothing but maybe the one job in town. and You didn't want to do it or you didn't want to die doing it. And your one ticket out of town was the military, whether you knew it was going to be or you didn't know it was going to be. Um, right. But it really did seem to open a lot of doors. And the more guys I talk to around your age, I'm always amazed at how much they managed to do and, and how far they managed to take it after the experience of being in the army or, or, or you know, war or anything like that. Um, 
did you do anything exciting with the, the nuclear engineer field? Is there anything that any uh, places that you worked or exciting things that happened with that? Because I mean, it doesn't doesn't seem like it should be a boring job. Uh, <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was, uh, being an engineer uh, uh, for Westinghouse and their atomic power uh, as they were designing atomic first atomic. As a matter of fact, I worked at the first atomic power plant in this in the world called okay. Shipping Corp. And uh, no, it. Uh, from there, I worked on design of uh, nuclear power plants, electrical power, and it was great. I, I saw the world. I, I it was able to, because we had, they were building uh, atomic power plants, Germany, Switzerland, France, big time, and of course, all of the United States. And I ended up, uh, I'd be back here in Pittsburgh area, because that's where Baldwin Borough is, mm -hmm. and I'd be back here. Uh, and get a call, head out for Japan. <laughs> and I jump on a plane, go, and they were having a problem uh, installing something or having a problem of some sort to concern uh, what I was knowledgeable in. And it was a great job. I did. So that's how I really spent almost all my, actually all my working career is uh, great challenging financially rewarding i can't complain <laughs> it really it Eight really lives. does it really does sound like just the the opening of your mind that there's a big world out there and that you can do it and survive it kept you going and doing it for a long time um yes. is there uh let me see if i've got any notes here on you um now I guess this, these are some more uh, topical, like uh, in the now questions. Um, did have since you've been in the military? It's quite obvious that everything has changed and how it operates, runs, acceptance, everything at this point in time. Is there anything that really stands out to you as uh, you know good or egregious? You know, either way, and what's changed. You mean as far as the military? Yeah, itself. Itself. Um, is there anything, uh, not really, uh, is there anything that amazes me in today's world, of course, is the advance in, tech, in, in, in uh, technology in uh, starting a war and ending a war in killing people <laughs> it's a shame but that, that had to be yeah that, if, we, if we had not done it we would uh, another country would be saluting their flag I, but, I believe that too and it does seem to be a, a, an escalation thing and the, the cooler stuff I have maybe we don't have to do anything with it um, right. but um, that, you know and, and definitely your era too um, they were, were definitely under equipping soldiers in, in all areas, whether it wasn't the right clothes or, you know, basically here's your whole combat outfit is a pair of dungarees and a, a button-up shirt. You know, now they have all the ceramic plates and the night vision and, the, and everything. Right. You know, um, makes them, you know, pretty pretty hard targets now. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, um, do you think there's anything... Um, outstanding that civilians should be aware of or learn from your experience as a veteran? It would be good, I think, it would be good if, uh, if the younger generation, the uh, teenage fellas in uh, early 20s, if they knew that there are some benefits that going into the military do provide and uh, an education. I don't know if the GI Bill still exists or not. I don't know. But uh, if it does, it was something that I didn't, wasn't even aware of. And, I, and then back then, of course, there was no TV, but you had radio and newspapers. And uh, I wasn't aware that uh, there was, that was a chance to get a, 
paid paid by the army education. Be nice if the more maybe that would entice uh, some of today's generation, young generation, to go in the military. And you're, of course, you're there. It would be they would get an education in, in the military, and from the military end of it, and they might be taking a risk to be sent off to a, a, a battlefield somewhere. So I guess they have to would have to weigh uh, the two. <laughs> I, I would think that that's probably the biggest, you know, last twenty years we've been at war. So you know, it, right? It's kind of tough to figure out, you know, how to avoid that, right? Um, but uh, no, I, I agree with you totally. If it's one of those things where you could see the, the the what people got out of it after the fact, or you know what skills they learned and things like that, and how that affected later in life. I mean, I I rarely meet a veteran that hasn't made some sort of success with themselves, you know, from your generation. Um, so you know, and it obviously gave you you know building skills and 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 interpersonal communications and all that stuff but uh yeah it had to be pretty pretty uh empowering to be able to get on a plane and go to japan and say let me fix your nuclear reactor <laughs> <laughs> yep um now uh is there anything that you've thought about just thinking about prepping for this interview that i haven't brought up or, or that we haven't come across naturally um that you'd like to talk about with your with your military or anything otherwise nothing i can nothing right off the top of my head uh but um no nothing that i can think of right. but um I mean, I've enjoyed talking with you, Ira. <laughs> oh, great, great. Well, I have one a more question, and this is, is, is kind of personal. Is, um, I've had my experiences with, you know, what America and Germany thought over the years, and it's definitely a different generation than yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but I, 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 there always seemed to be some, some admiration of Germans towards Americans, um, yeah. and whether it was our textiles or our TV or just you know, us. Um, was that apparent clear back when you were there or is that something? No. Still, so I no. how were you treated as an American in Germany at that point in time? Back then when I was there, that wasn't, a, was not apparent. No. Gotcha. No, but, yeah. No. Uh, well, just thinking about the things that they no, it really was not apparent. Because it's, it's in no doubt, you know, the, the presence of the U.S. military there over those years that definitely built that up or brought Levi jeans to the table, you know, that type of stuff. Oh, yeah. um, so, you know, I was just curious where that was at, you know, really pigeonholing what, you know, the countryside looked like. Like you said, that World War II was still prevalent. You could still see it in the landscape. Um but no, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was it was interesting for sure. Um, anything else that you visited there that stands out? I mean, oh, I've been been since then. I've been over to uh, Germany, Bavaria. Um, took my wife over to Oberammergau down in the uh, southern part of Germany. So I have, I've been over into Germany probably three different times now, uh, mainly sightseeing. And uh, the people have recovered uh, remarkably well and uh, they appear to be our friends now instead of our enemies, so. <laughs> so do you have a, did you manage to get a grasp on German itself? I mean, you're sure. obvious. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. My sister ended up getting it uh, mastered well enough that she could take a trip to Germany and, and, and function. Um, oh, yeah. I could just tell people my name and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you did mention that um, you were pretty good shot with the BB gun. Um, but your, <laughs> your, daughter, your, your daughter did mention to me at one point that you've been uh, a pretty, pre pretty avid outdoorsman. 
hunting and fishing and all that? Hunting, fishing, yes. Um, I had made up my mind that uh, to, I wanted to get into Africa to hunt. Okay. And uh, my uh, wife and I checked with the doctor back then, right away I retired, I was 62. And he said, well, you have to get five shots to back then to prevent getting any of the diseases. I says, oh, that, 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 that did not appeal to me. <laughs> uh, so I set up the North American continent as my goal. It was going to be my Africa to try to get one of every big game animal on the North American continent, everything from bears to moose to uh, uh, of course, I shot a ton of white-tailed deer, uh, and uh, I succeeded. So I can't. No complain. kidding. No kidding. Um, how far south did you end up taking that trip? Did you go all the way down through Mexico, or um, uh, Texas was about as far as I, I hunted Texas, and then three other states in the United States. But did a lot of my hunting up in. Canada for the caribou, the, the bear, the moose, the other game, big game animals. And, but I succeeded in getting them all. And it had to work out, but I enjoyed the outdoors. You know, absolutely. And now with my bad knees, I can't do it, but I sure did enjoy it. We could get you fishing on a dock. Oh, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, um, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I really appreciate you sitting down with me, Ron. Um, I'll maybe, uh, if I have your permission, I'll, I'll hit you up and talk to you again in the future sometime. Um, Great. But thank, thank your family for for helping get this working, and um, and we, you know, thanks to Bre Veteran Breakfast Club for introducing us. I had fun chatting with you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. It's been great. Hey, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, I'll, I'll get in touch with you again soon.